Hi, my name is Ryan Duggan. I'm going to talk about some of my experience um, evaluating the Novacite Quantion as well as a bunch of other instruments. And really the, the gist of this is to demonstrate some of the tools that I like to use and applications that I like to use in evaluating what seems like a new cytometer coming out every other month, right? So how can we go through and uh, evaluate things such that we can pick a cytometer that will work best for us? So first of all, my disclosures. And what I want to focus on, I'm going to build this as really some new developments from the technology standpoint in flow cytometry over the recent years that fall into a few of these categories. And these I feel nowadays matter more so to the actual performance of your cytometer in the end. So I'm going to focus a little bit about uh, detectors and um, kind of this idea of standardized voltages or gains on a cytometer. Uh, really the increasing of the dynamic range, the amount of fluorescence that you can detect from every cell. The uh, advances in dim population resolution. Um, how cytometers are becoming overall easier to use. And then uh, a quick word about measuring the full spectrum of fluorophores. So in terms of detectors, one of the main advances that many companies have uh, changed to is using some more solid state detectors, specifically looking at avalanche photodiodes, or in the case of the Quantion, uh, an array of diodes in this silicon-based uh, photomultiplier. And the, the result of this is basically the ability to have greater quantum efficiency over a wider range of wavelengths that you're going to use on your flow cytometer. So just in base quantum efficiency measurements, meaning the efficiency with which a detector can take light photons coming in and convert it to an electrical signal, signal that can be measured by downstream electronics. And if you look at photomultiplier tubes, they're pretty good in the, uh, say, higher energy, lower wavelength photons. They're able to convert that pretty well. But especially when you get into the further red region, that's where we typically see PMT suffer a little bit in terms of their quantum efficiency. Whereas APDs, have this unique characteristic of being having really good quantum efficiency all the way out to the very far red range, even into the near infrared range. Um, you can see down at the very low end, they suffer a little bit in terms of quantum e efficiency from these very low wavelength, but the low energy, high wavelength photons, they do a really good job. And basically what that translates a lot of times into is better resolution. So this is just a sample that was collected on an instrument that uses solid state detectors versus an instrument that uses photomultipliers. It's not a totally fair comparison because the instruments also have different laser powers and filters and all that kind of stuff. But just in general, what we typically see is tighter resolution of the negative cells and better resolution of these dim positives, as an example. So the detector type, uh, switching to these solid state uh, photodiode type detectors seems to have a uh, better impact on collecting these low amounts of photons from very dim signals and still giving you good resolution and good uh, detection of populations. The second thing I want to just mention here is this overall trend of attempting to standardize voltages and gains on your cytometer. This becomes almost a necessity when you're talking about 25 plus colors. I mean, it's, it's basically unreasonable to think that you're gonna sit down at an instrument and move slider bars for 25 different detectors every time you come to run your samples. That's just not an efficient use of time. So there is a, a tried and true method for optimizing uh, either voltages on a PMT system or gains on a, a solid state detector system which uses as a readout the stain index um, and just marches, a, uh, marches the voltage or gain up and down the scale to maximize that stain index. And if you're unfamiliar with this technique, you basically take the, the MFI, the positive population, 
minus the MFI of the negative population divided by two times the robust standard deviation of the negative. So this takes into account both the separation, the raw separation between the two peaks, as well as the spread of the negative. And if you calculate this stain index over a series of gains, you can see here that that stain index will plateau at some point. And this shows me essentially what is the minimum gain I would need to have on this cytometer for this channel in order to maximize the stain index. Okay, and here's another way of looking at it. So here I've just taken all of the individual data files at the different gain setting and concatenated them together just to display them all at once. And so you can see the negative population and positive population. And as soon as you get up to about this 350, 400 range in terms of gain, you've maximized the resolution of the two populations. As you increase the gain even further, you get no more benefit from the increased gain in terms of resolving that population. And really all you're doing is spreading that negative out and reducing your dynamic range on the high end because you've amplified the signal so much. Okay, so you can do this uh, pretty easily. In this case, I've just taken some splenocytes, um, stained them with a CD4 antibody conjugated to BV421, and just ran it at intervals of, uh, say, 50 units on the gain or voltage setting, starting at 200 all the way up to, like, close to 800. Okay, so it's pretty easy to do. You could do it in every channel, and you could do that um, for different markers or different fluorophores, and that typically doesn't affect things. So if you have CD4 in a lot of different colors or CD8 in a lot of different colors, throw it on some cells, march the voltages up and down, optimize this distance using the stain index, and now you've determined the minimum gain that you're going to use for every detector on your instrument. Uh, the nice part about this is is I think companies are doing this proactively now. So for example, um, I know for the, the Quantion, the gains across the different detectors were set up in very much this method. So now when I go approach an instrument to run my samples, I basically take my fully stained sample and just start running it uh, along with my comp controls as opposed to putting on unstained cells and moving voltages up and down. Along with this, um, phenomenon of the optimized gain settings is the dynamic range. So I mentioned a little bit by increasing the gain so much past the maximum resolution um, setting that you might use, all you're really going to do is reduce the amount of dynamic range you have because you've brought your negatives up so high, your positives are more likely to go off scale on the high end. But with newer instruments, you can actually um, increase the amount of signal that you can detect, um, allowing you to detect even very dim signals as well as very bright signals with one gain setting all on the same scale. So this is a, a method that I like to do. Again, at these optimized PMT or gain settings, I just take some unstained splenocytes, uh, run them on the instrument. I get a distribution like this. Then I take the 90th percentile channel value. So in this case, on the Quantion, it was at 687. Uh, this is a Faxdiva running system. So you can see here, it's got the five log decade. And usually you'll set your unstains around 10 to the second or so. So you can see my 90th percentile on this system is at 102, which is pretty typical. And then the max linear range um, you just grab whatever the highest value is of the scale that is still on the linear range of the scale. And what I mean by that is, um, this is pretty easy to see if you have a system running Faxdiva. Uh, if you open up your baseline report when you run CSNT, it'll go through on every channel and tell you what the max channel is while still maintaining in the linear range. So it goes through every channel and gives you a value like 240,000 for example. That means any signals that are above 240,000 with the max channel being 262,000 is actually outside of the linear range and things like compensation won't work very well on those signals. So you wanna be underneath this value. So I took that max linear, linear, linear channel as the upper end on this system. And we can see here, we get about 3.4 logs of scale to work with. So that means I have all of this scale to show positive cells. 
But what if you have that, that antigen that's just always bright, right? You're looking at, let's say, MAC class 2, and you put it on BV421 for some reason. And you want to stay in that saturating levels because you want to measure how much expression of MC, MHC class 2 is on these cells. So it's on this scale, you have a better chance of it being off scale and having to reduce the voltages. What happens when you reduce the voltages? Well, we saw from the last slide that you reduce your ability to resolve dim populations if you use too low of a voltage. So I want both the maximum voltage to give me better resolution of those dim populations, but I also need more scale to see bright things. So on here, I have uh, pretty much one more full log of resolution to be able to pick out both bright things and dim things at the same time. Okay, so this log scale here, this uh, increased dynamic range is actually really valuable. I don't have to pre-screen all my samples in order to make sure that everything's on scale. I can just have confidence that it's gonna be on scale. So with this larger dynamic range, like I mentioned, it really means that I don't have to mess around with my voltages or gains very much. I'm just showing the same sample that's been run on, uh, say, a Fax Canto and a Quantion. And you can see here there's some markers. So this, um, sorry, the labels are a little small, but this is CD44 on CD8s and CD4s. And you can see the CD44 signal when stained at saturation using a pretty bright dye. In this case, it's PE. is very much approaching that higher end of the scale where um, if there was any increase in CD44 in another sample type, I might actually go off scale in here. But on the Quantion, I have you know, another log, log and a half of range here to be able to see increases in fluorescence, which is very useful. And uh, the other thing is if you put the Quantion data then rescaled and put it on that 262,000 scale, this is essentially what it looks like. So the data on the scale normalized to what we see on, on say, a Fax Canto, these populations are pretty much off scale at this point. So again, showing you that it's not that this signal is dimmer, say, on the, on the Quantion. It's just that the scale is bigger, and you're able to see more stuff there. OK, the next thing I just want to mention, and I won't spend too much time on it because it's a little bit convoluted, but uh, suffice it to say that what I've noticed in uh, recent instruments, pretty much every instrument that has come out in recent years, is they all have really good dim population resolution. I think the manufacturers have kind of um, leaned into this as an objective of theirs on instrumentations and through laser powers and uh, laser focusing and fluidics and electronics and optics have really uh, increased the performance. The way that I like to assess this is using uh, dim population resolution. So again, I'll just walk you through this quickly. So this peak here serves as unstained lymphocytes. And I'm using the quantum simply, simply cellular beads from Bangs Labs, and I stain them with a uh, conjugated antibody. So I can use whatever antibody I want, but for normalization's sake, I typically use the CD4 GK1.5 conjugated to whatever color I want to test and run that on the instrument. By doing that, the beads tell me an exact number of uh, binding sites that are available on the surface. And when stained at saturation, I can correlate the binding site capacity of each one of these beads to the measured fluorescence intensity. And I can come up with a regression line. And then I extrapolate that regression line down to a population where the 10% uh, value of the positive sample here is equal to the 90th percentile of the negative. So that's my overlap ratio. Anything that has more overlap than that, I cannot resolve. Anything that has less overlap than that, I will be able to resolve. And whatever the, the extrapolated uh, ABC value of this peak is, that is my minimum number of fluorophores bound to, an bound to a cell that I'll be able to resolve from unstained lymphocytes. OK? So this value then is a meaningful number, which tells me now if I have something that's stained dimly, uh, how many copies of that receptor need to exist on the cell surface in order for me to resolve it from my unstained cells? And if we put some numbers onto that, the y-axis here now being uh, these overlap ratio values. So these are real, real numbers here. Uh, for example, this is uh, the 
cell, positive cell has to have 1,000 copies of the receptor in order to be resolved from unstained cells. In the FITSI channel, um, uh, these are the five main channels that I typically assess, 421, FITSI, PE, PE size 7, and APC. A really good five color uh, panel if you ever need to do five colors. And if we compare this to what everybody would probably agree kind of the gold standard is, is a Fortes X20, right? So everybody has one. Uh, let's compare the performance. So you can see across many of these channels, uh, the Quantion is as good um, or maybe better in some cases than the Fortessa. So this is giving you assurance that with things like the solid state detectors, laser power, fluidics, electronics, that you're going to get good dim population resolution um, on this instrument. And if we even compare it to the, the original Nova site, you can see um, significant improvements have been made now on the next generation Quantion that allows you to resolve even dimmer fluorescence. Um, also, you can see quickly just across instrument, across channels on a given instrument, which channel is going to be your best. So you could say, let's put really dim stuff on BV421 because that's where we're getting the best resolution. Whereas maybe Fitzy, we don't want to put our dimmest uh, markers on there, although it's pretty still pretty good. So. Um, I think more recently I put a lot more weight on ease of use than anything else. Like I said, lots of instruments perform really, really well these days. So what's going to differentiate them more so than anything else is things like software, uh, ease of use, maintenance, kind of longevity of the instruments, things like that. So I, I, although there's no quantitative metric for ease of use, I'll just put down some anecdotes here. Uh, one thing that I really like on the Quantion is uh, it has a single hardware button that both turns the instrument on and does the fluidic startup without having to even log into the computer. So now if you're a user of, say, the Fax Canto, for example, um, great instrument, but it's quite an intensive process to get things started. First of all, you know, you turn the instrument on, uh, it has a 10-minute warm-up period. But you can't actually do a fluidic startup until you actually log into the software and go to a prompt and say, run fluidic startup. Um, on the Quantium, all I do is hit a button, walk away, come back in five minutes, and the instrument's already ready to go. Fluidic startup is done. It's already uh, ready for QC at that point. So it's a really nice feature. Of course, it has um, pretty typical program commands for cleaning, unclogging, debubbling, things like that. Uh, you don't have to put any additional tubes or plates on it because it has cleaning solutions on board that can run through and declog and clean the instrument for you. Uh, we talked about, um, or sorry, the, the loader has uh, the, the capacity to really um, load pretty much everything that you'd want to. So any kind of plate, UV, flat bottom, 96, 384, but also deep well plates, uh, it has a rack of tubes. So pretty much whatever user comes into the, the lab to run samples on the instrument, whether they have it in, say, those little racks of bullet tubes, 1ML bullet tubes, you can just put that right on the instrument and run your samples directly out of that without having to transfer them to some format that is uh, a little bit more standardized across instruments. We talked about the optimized detector gains out of the box easy setup and start running, and the dynamic range. Um, another one of my favorite features here is, um, so if you have a, a plate loader, that's essentially kind of gives you a walk away operation. You can start your plate, walk away, come back in half hour, hour, and your plate's done and you're ready to analyze. But the, the, the nice thing here is, you know, let's say I have 10 plates to run today. I get through nine of them. I put my tens plate on, and then I check a little box that says, when the tens plate is finished, clean yourself, and then shut yourself off. So I put my tens plate on, check that box, and go home. Um, and then, you know, the data's run, and I can come and check it out the next morning. So you always get that extra plate of runtime on a day because you don't have to be there at the end to wait for the shutdown uh, and actually power the system off. It does that by itself. Um, 
the maintenance and scheduling of uh, changes of fluids and um, filters and things like that is pretty easy to do and keeps for problem free, free operation uh, at months of the, uh, at a time. The system is also volumetric in that it can give you absolute counts as a readout if you so desire. You don't need to spike your samples with beads. You just check a box that says I want absolute counts and now your stat window has a column that says cells per microliter or cells per ml. If you did a dilution before that to actually do cell counts, um, you can actually program that dilution back in and it'll give you, you know, kind of calculated, back calculated cells per ml of your original sample. Um, and actually the Quantion is basically the only, the, the, the system that I use now for all cell counting purposes. You know, we have uh, a bunch of other cell counters, image base and whatnot, tripan, blue base. Um, but I found that flow cytometry with like DAPI and PI uh, along with forward scatter is going to be the most accurate live cell count that you can get. And so if I can set that up in a plate and just run through and have absolute counts turned on, at the very end I just export a table of all my counts uh, back calculated to my dilution factor that I put in on the front end. And then the software is is uh, also has some nice features in it. So, you know, it's it's software, so it has all the things you'd expect. You make plots, you draw regions, you create stat windows, things like that. Uh, the unique things here, I'd say, is the ability to review data of a previous well. So, as it's collecting, say, well B2, and I say, oh, I see, I see this shift, but is it real? Um, <clears throat> and I can go back to, say, my control was in A1. I can just click on A1 while it's collecting B2 still and just review the data of A1 and say, oh, yeah, that was lower. Let me see what the median was of that population. And I can go back right back to B2, or maybe it's on B3 at this point. Uh, it keeps going regardless of what you're doing. So having that ability to not have to stop things go back to a previous well and then start them again, I think I find has been really useful. Um, also it has some unique features like throwing up heat maps, um, tables of statistics, things like that. And this is done real time. So I can draw this heat map out and as my samples are collecting, it just starts filling in the colors and readjusting the colors as you get more and more. So again, I don't have to wait for the end to see that I have, you know, my dose titration is looking good. So I just want to mention something really quick about spectral cytometry. It's, you know, of course, all the rage now, and everybody wants to do spectral cytometry. And I'll say the ability to do spectral cytometry is not necessarily limited to a instrument that is called a spectral cytometer, right? So all spectral cytometry means is that you're oversampling the collection of, floor of photons from the full spectrum. So as long as you have a sufficient number of detectors on each laser, you can do spectral cytometry and spectral deconvolution. So with the 25 detectors now on the Quantion, uh, if you're running only 10 colors, um, you know, maybe the old adage was turn off the channels you're not using to save on space and things like that. Yeah, we won't do that anymore. So you collect all light from every detector every time. And now by oversampling that data um, outside of the peak channel, you can use software to do spectral deconvolution. And the importance of that is it actually improves your data. So Flojo version 10.6, it's currently in beta, but you can sign up for a beta trial if you want. Um, you can take fluorescence data from any instrument. As long as you have more detectors collected than you do have um, single stain controls, you can just check a button, say I want to do spectral cytometry. It's the same interface that you're used to using. And then you can actually spectrally deconvolute your samples instead of doing regular compensation. Um, spectral cytometers are unique in that they usually have many more detectors off of each laser, so the granularity of those measurements are a little bit higher. But just to show you here an example, this is PE size 7 data that I collected on our Quantion. Now, I went ahead, in hindsight, maybe it wasn't the greatest choice. Uh, but I went ahead and customized my Quantion just to 16 detectors because there was specific colors that I wanted to see. Um, so I have a 16 detector Quantion. But this is the, this is the spectrum of PE size 7. So you can see 
off the violet laser, not much until you get to the high violet, like V780. And then the blue laser, not much here. Here's the PE off the yellow laser. Here's PE size 7, the max. Here's APC and an APC size 7. Okay, if you look at the same sample off of, say, in this case, the Aurora, it's pretty much the same picture, right? So you still have the violet channels with that little peak at the end of the violet laser. The blue channels, here's PE size 7 again. Here's that PE from the tandem. And here's APC size 7 again. So very similar data from the Quantian as you would get from a spectral, a truer spectral cytometer, um, the Aurora. But in Flojo, you can take this data. So here I've, I've just, I just have five colors here. I check the box that says that I want to do spectral. And then I can walk through, and it does, creates a compensation matrix post-spectral deconvolution. And what I, what I want to point out is that if you look at the, the spillover matrix, and I'll explain that in a minute if you're unsure, but Flojo calculates a total spillover, uh, spillover spreading matrix score for all of the colors in a panel. So when you do regular compensation, it gives you a value of 3. And when you do spectral deconvolution, it gives you a value of 2.5. So this means that the same exact single stain controls, just by doing spectral unmixing versus regular compensation, we've reduced the overall spreading of our data. And by reducing spreading, we increase dim population resolution. Let me explain that a little bit more. So there's a lot of math here. You could ignore all of it. Uh, in, basically, this is just how you calculate the spillover spreading. Uh, you don't actually have to calculate it ever because you just click a button in Flojo and it does it for you. But low spillover spreading looks something like this. High spillover spreading looks something like this. If I wanted to resolve double positive populations, which one would I want to resolve it on? This one, right? I can resolve much dimmer double positive cells in this case without the spreading than I can in this case. So if I can do spectral deconvolution with my data off the Quantion and reduce the spillover spreading, um, I want to do that. And that will give me better resolution of dim double positive cells. OK, so just in summary here, um, some of the key features that I like to focus on for evaluating cytometers is, again, this dim population resolution. Um, anybody can detect you know, CD4 and CD8. What you want to be able to do is detect those really dim signals that you're getting off of instruments. And that is affected by things like the detectors. We talked about that. Um, and even maybe this spectral deconvolution might help with that. Also, these optimized gains, that um, helps both in terms of ease of use and setup, but also having uh, a larger dynamic range means you have to fuss with that a lot less. And then these usability features that we talked about are really key. I mean, whatever is going to make me more efficient in the lab is great. And if I have to spend less time futzing around with the hardware and I could just collect data and then go to analysis, that's going to be better. So I want to just quickly touch on one uh, example application. And I know um, earlier Jeff was talking a little bit more about uh, immunophenotyping stuff, which is great. But I feel like immunophenotyping is mostly a function of how good you are at panel design. Right, I, can make, I can make a panel look good on any instrument as long as I spend enough time figuring out which colors work best on this instrument, where, where do I need to avoid spillover, and then how to pair up those colors with the right antibodies. Okay, so that is almost instrument agnostic. So I don't want to show an example like that, but I want to show an example that utilizes the high dynamic range and utilizes dim population resolution. And this is an example using uh, fluorescent cell barcoding for the what I feel feel is like the ultimate high throughput application, right? So basically, if you're unfamiliar, you can use fluorescent dyes to at different concentrations to basically create a matrix of cells that, when mixed together, will show up as different populations on the cytometer. Each one of those populations translates back to an individual well uh, from the beginning. And I'll show you some images to make that a little bit clearer. But the advantage of this is really now you have a bunch of samples in a single tube that you run once on the cytometer. So the number of samples you can actually multiplex uh, in a given tube or well goes up exponentially. Also, 
the uh, additional staining that you might do, like let's say you're going to do some phospho staining or something like that, all of your samples are now in one tube, and you add antibodies to that one tube. So you've effectively reduced down to zero well-to-well -well variation in staining or tube-to-tube -tube variation in staining. And then lastly, it can save on reaching costs because now I've put, you know, 10 samples in one tube and concentrated that in, you know, half a mil and use antibody once in that one tube as opposed to putting a half a mil in 10 tubes and adding antibodies to every one of them. Uh, the disadvantage really is, you know, there's added time in barcoding, so you have to work out those conditions. So it does take some upfront time. Um, also, you lose a couple of channels depending on how many channels you want to dedicate to barcoding. But again, having 25 channels now on an instrument, you have the luxury to be able to, to do that. So this is a, an example that we ran in the lab here. So I'm using Alexa 350, which is uh, actually excited very well off the 405 laser, even though it's technically thought of as a UV excitable dye. I'm also using Alexa Floor 48 and Alexa 700. And you can see I have seven intensities of 350, so seven different populations this way. I have six intensities of 48, which is right here, and I have six intensities of Alexa 700. So seven times six times six is 252 samples that I can pull together in a single tube. Okay, so that's two, 250 samples in one tube that I'm gonna run on my cytometer. And you can see the resolution we're getting here is great. Um, I, can, I can pick out even these dim populations here from the negatives, no problem. And I have enough dynamic range that I can have very bright things and very dim things simultaneously. So let's do a little math here. So let's say in each one of these samples, I wanted 1,000 events because I'm just doing a quick screen, yes, no answer. If I have 252 samples times 1,000 events, it's 250,000 total events. At 10,000 events per second, I could go faster, but let's say 10,000 events per second. That would take 25 seconds to collect 252 samples or 10 samples per second. Okay, so that's effectively the amount of time I'm spending the instrument is I can get up to 10 samples per second. If then I took that 250,000 cells representing 252 samples and put that in well A1, well A2, I could do 252 more samples. A3, I could do 252 more samples. So now I do that across a plate and I have millions of samples represented on a single plate. So let's, just, let's say, oh, 1,000 cells is not enough. Let's go up to 10,000 cells per, per well, or per population here. At that, it would take about four minutes, or about one sample per second. Okay, so there's no instrument that can do, go from well to well to well, and do a sample per second. All right, so if you really are serious about doing high throughput, uh, fluorescent barcoding and multiplexing samples in a single well or tube is really the way to go. Also, with, um, if you did want more cells per event, that just translates to staining more cells in the beginning. So here we're at two and a half million cells. You could do more cells than that. So maybe you're, <coughs> excuse me, maybe you're not going to do it in wells anymore, but you're going to do it in tubes. Well, that's fine. I have a 40 tube rack on the Quantion. Now I can set up a rack of 40 tubes, each one of them millions of cells representing 250 uh, individual samples from my um, original wells. Okay, so the example that I'm going to show you really quickly is just a competitive binding assay. It's very simple. Um, the goal of this is basically to do some epitope binning. So let's say you do an antibody screen where you want to generate hundreds of antibodies against a specific antigen. Um, whether you're doing this in a mouse or you're doing this um, in cell lines, regardless, you're going to come out with, let's say, 100 antibodies. You want to make sure that you don't want to test all 100, so maybe you're going to bin them to see if they all bind the same epitope or different epitopes. And you can use a simple competitive binding assay to say whether each antibody binds the same epitope as the antibody right next to it. So they did some, uh, some barcoding here. And we just expanded on this um, here to do a little bit more and a little bit cleaner. So in general, what the way it goes is I have Let's say I have four samples. I'll do it with four antibodies. It's a little bit more understandable. Each one of those samples, I'm going to stain with a different concentration of the barcoding dye. So it gives me four populations. Each one of those populations, I'm going to stain with the primary antibody. So we'll just call that antibody one or the binding antibody. 
Then I'm going to take them and mix them all together. I'm going to take that mixture and split it up again by four. Now each one of these samples contains uh, the four original samples with the original antibody bound. And I'm going to come back in with each antibody again and look for competition. So for example, these four antibodies that have one, two, three, and four different antibodies bound to them, I'm going to come back in with antibody one. So of course, this antibody and this antibody are going to compete because it's the same antibody. But this one and this one may not compete. And you might get binding of both antibodies. If you then come in with a fluorescent secondary, you can track the intensity of that measurement. So let's say I take sample A, I deconvolve it into its four original samples, and then I measure, say, the PE fluorescence on each one of them. So low fluorescence means that they bound the same epitope. There was no increase in binding. They competed each other. Increase of PE fluorescence means that they bound different ep epitopes, and now I have two different epitopes that I can bin antibodies together. So I could do that four pretty easily, and maybe you do it manually without barcoding with four. But what if you wanted to do 24? So here's a case where we're doing 24 antibodies. So I used two concentrations of, the, of a violet dye. I used three concentrations of a red dye and four concentrations of a green dye to give me 24 barcoded populations. And then I stained each one of those with one of these antibodies, mixed them together, split them back out, stained again with each one of those antibodies, and then read them on the instrument. So in this case, each, each antibody has a coordinate. For example, uh, antibody number 13 here has the coordinate V0, so no violet dye, G0, no green dye, and red 0, no red, no red dye. So I call that V0, R0, G0. So that's the coordinate by flow cytometry that I'll be able to say this was in fact the sample that was originally stained with antibody 13. Whereas antibody 6 is V1, so the first population of violet, G2, so G0, G1, G2, and then R2, R0, R1, R2, V1, G2, R2 is antibody 6. Okay, so that's how I can decode things on the back end. <coughs> Excuse me. And so by flow cytometry, this is what it looks like. I have my two peaks of the violet, V0, V1. From V0, I could split that up into my four populations of green, my three populations of red. Here is, again, V0, G0, R0, that same peak, antibody 13. Here is, again, V1, um, G2, R2, um, antibody 6 that I was looking at before. Each one of these populations, I can um, use an automated gating script that will pull each one of them out by themselves, and then I can measure PE intensity. So here is something where we'd say these competed with each other. They're probably binding the same epitope. My original binding antibody, uh, number 16, had this fluorescence intensity. When I added test antibody 17 on top of it, I saw minimal to no increase of fluorescence. They bind the same epitope. I bin them together. These two, however, antibody 1 gives me double the fluorescence from antibody 16 alone. So I know that that was actually additional binding, these two bind different epitopes, I can put them in separate bins. I do that with all of the antibodies, all the combinations, and I come up with a spreadsheet and say, hey, here are my group of antibodies that I know bind a different epitope, because they all have additive binding when they're done in combination. Everything else binds the same epitope. I can effectively bin all my antibodies and then go within that bin and do other binding assays and whatnot to pick out the clone that I actually want. Okay, so just to wrap things up here, um, you know, we're able to achieve this high efficiency through having uh, the additional laser lines and the additional detectors to dedicate some of the channels to barcoding and then efficiently measure things like PE or other colors off of that. This fluorescent barcoding is really a, a, a proven tool for doing high throughput screening if you're interested in doing that kind of stuff. And it doesn't have to be crazy 252 sample high throughput screening. You can see in this last example, we were just doing 24 samples. But to matrix that out 24 by 24, that's a lot of tubes. Uh, if you could just do it all in one tube or, or 24 tubes, that's great. And then we were able to achieve this using the Quantion um, by having the ability to do dim population resolution 
Uh, again, that large dynamic range to see all of those peaks simultaneously. Uh, standardized gains, and then the, the loader gives us some flexibility, whether we want to do tubes or wells, whatever we can do that. And then really, um, you know, I think what differentiates this instrument for us and why we ended up choosing it in the end is these ease of use things. I can get started so quickly in the morning. Um, shutdown always gets done and it always gets done the right, right way because no person has to do it, right? It's, it's automated. Uh, so you don't have to rely on did the last person of the day shut the instrument down the right way and do all the cleaning. Uh, you just click a button and you leave. Okay, so with that, I will uh, end it. Um, we are, I think, at the end of our time, but um, feel free to ask some questions or, you know, better yet, you know, just stop by the booth at some point. I'm sure there'll be people around who can talk to you about uh, the instrument. All right, thank you.